Okay, so um, welcome everybody. We wanted to welcome you to our uh, webinar and I want to introduce uh, what we're talking about and our guest today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with our intro slide. So our goal today, we'll be talking about multidisciplinary care in complex kind of gray zone head and neck cancer cases, specifically focusing on the uses of immunotherapy. We're hoping we have a really good multidisciplinary discussion and to help us with this, uh, we have our moderators uh, at some point, that'll be myself as well as Dr. Jeff Liu from Temple University and Fox Chase. We also have Dr. Christina Henson uh, from University of Oklahoma and Dr. Min Fan from University of Oklahoma for radiation oncology and medical oncology, respectively. We have Dr. Rahul Ladwa, who's joining us from um, Princess Alexandra Hospital as our medical oncologist from abroad, and Lachlan McDowell, who is uh, joining us from Peter McCollum Cancer Center as well. So thank you guys. And we are going to just go ahead and get right into it. So let's start with the case. Everybody loves starting with the case. Um, I also wanna um, point out that we have to put this disclosure in there, it's just for healthcare providers. Um, and our, our webinar is being uh, funded by Roche. So we are going to start with the case of advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Let's uh, start with this patient that came in a couple months ago. He's an 85 year old man. He had a recurrent cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the ear. And I emphasize recurrent. It started in 2017. He had a Mohs surgery done. 2019 came back, had another Mohs, had radiation, came back two more times after that, treated with local excisions. And he came in today with yet another excision, a new recurrence with ulceration. Uh, he also has a history of a leaky heart valve. No follow up on this. Um, he's not immunocompromised. He's pretty active during the day, despite his age, does a lot of volunteer work. Here's what it looks like. So his whole article is firm, uh, it's edematous. You can see prior areas where he's had other malignancies taken off. There's ulceration just inside the external ear canal. There's also this deep ulceration postauricularly that extends down to the mastoid. At the time that we saw him, his facial nerve function was intact. He wasn't having any numbness or anything like that. There were no palpable lymph nodes on his exam. We went ahead and got a little bit of a workup. Uh, this is just his standard CT scan where you can see that this area um, that had previously been biopsied before the patient came in uh, is ulcerative, extends down into the parotid tissue, and there's also a lymph node that's involved. So here's where I want to stop and talk about uh, how various members of this panel would manage this. So we're staging this patient as a T3N1. And our first question uh, for kind of the team is how are cutaneous malignancies like this evaluated at your center? Specifically, how do they come in? How are they filtered? And who sees the patient first? So maybe I'll uh, ask uh, Dr. Henson to first speak up. Um, I know you're in radiation oncology. And so I think you get referrals from a variety of different sources. And I'm curious about other sort of direct referrals from head and neck surgeons versus dermatologists, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, sure. So so cases like this, at least at OU, um, we have a very robust head and neck surgery program. So most cases like this are coming through then. Um, and we have a multidisciplinary clinic that we would try to schedule this patient during, kind of knowing that there are probably going to be multiple disciplines involved in, in the care of this patient. Um, for radiation, even if I'm not going to treat him, it would be helpful for me to be able to obtain the prior records from wherever they had their radiation and, and kind of help the surgeons in making decisions. Um, occasionally, they'll come from dermatology, but, but usually they're referring them to surgery first, and then surgery is, is involving us. And what about outside your institution? Do you sometimes get referrals where the patient has already had surgery, and then you're sort of looking at the pathology uh, post facto and trying to figure it out? That happens occasionally, and usually in those cases, um, again, I'll, I'll uh, try to bring them to our multidisciplinary clinic myself and, and have them presented at, at tumor board. Thanks. Dr. McDowell, how are things work um, you know, in Australia? I know that um, our Australian colleagues see some, you guys have some of the great, greatest data on cutaneous cancers, given that your number of fair-skinned individuals in, on the continents and their loving of the sun. So how do the patients come to you for treatment? I guess given the, the sheer volume of, um, you know, of patients, as you've alluded to with, um, you know, cutaneous uh, SCC, there's probably a number of ways that this patient may end up um, at our institution. Um, and that may be, uh, I guess, in the earlier part of their treatment, 
Um, at Peter Mac, we have both a cutaneous and a, a radiation oncology unit, as well as a uh, head and neck unit, which tend to manage some of the more complex um, patients. Um, this patient may well have been managed with dermatology um, uh, in the initial phases, uh, but likely by the time that um, the patient is presenting with this extent of disease, they're probably likely to be referred um, into the EMT for uh, service for further um, evaluation. And then really, um, I guess the radiation oncology uh, input depends on who's probably um, been caring for the patient uh, previously. Do we also get the referrals through dermatologists uh, also, or do they almost always come through ENT before they come to you? The skin, if the, the, the two different units will definitely get uh, referrals from dermatologists. Yes, we may well get uh, referrals from dermatology um, as well as the ENTs. And we do have um, two separate um, MDTs at Peter Mac. Um, so it really depends on, um, you know, which of the radiation oncology units manage, manage the patients depend on which um, MDT they're presented at. And Dr. Patel, when you sort of um, trigger a referral to your radiation oncology colleagues in general, so we're pretty fortunate in our setup where we do have a true multidisciplinary clinic um, where our new patients are evaluated with both myself and radiation oncology embedded. Uh, so if I think that a patient is coming to see me with an advanced stage uh, cutaneous malignancy, which most of them are, then I will that day grab our radiation oncology colleague and have them meet with the patient and talk about the possibility of radiation in the adjuvant setting or sometimes in the primary setting, depending on the patient. Thanks. Our institution is very similar that um, we work as a team-based process. So we try to get our radiation oncologists on board sooner rather than later. Even if they don't get radiation on the back end, sometimes the pathology is more favorable. That's okay. as well Because it's more difficult when they haven't been involved and all of a sudden you feel like you're getting, um, you're doing some catch-up. Um, Rusha, want to move on to the next slide? Yep. Ooh, I did. All right. So this patient had a little bit of a delay because of his leaky valve. We had to have him see his cardiologist, took about four weeks. Um, he called and said his eye kept watering. We had him come in and surprisingly or not surprisingly, at this point had a left facial nerve palsy. Complete Husbrackman six out of six. We got an MRI scan and his tumor had progressed. He also had enhancement of his facial nerve to the stylomastoid foramen uh, concerning for perineural spread. So at this point, we have a couple questions on this slide uh, that I would like the panel to kind of consider. The first being, how would you counsel this patient about surgery? So, you know, we're looking at, um, this is obviously a very ominous uh, progression. Um, you want me to go, Rusha, or, or you want to take it on yourself? Um, let's hear what you have to say, and I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> you know, I think the imaging here is very important. Um, in general, the... Um, the, the cancer is always worse than the actual imaging that you see. So I think it's important to study the imaging with your neuroradiological colleagues and make sure that there's not enhancement all the way up to the geniculator or, or skull base if you can avoid that. So at least if that's not there, um, there's a possibility of achieving a negative margin on the facial nerve, at least closer to the style, of, at least you know within the mastoid. And um, that's, a, that's a first step. And, and, and conversely, you hope that from a clinical examination, you can achieve a negative margin along the distal branches of the facial nerve. But this, these are things that are sort of unknowable until you've put the patient um, into surgery and started the process. So I think the, a key part of the discussion here is the uncertainty of achieving an R0 or negative margin excision. Uh, certainly in my practice, I, you know, and I think in many others, um, the goal here is to achieve a, an R0 resection. If you really realistically can't achieve an R0 resection and you're looking at maybe at best an R1, I think you move to a slightly different multidisciplinary conversational space. But so far with the discussion that we're having, I think the, at least with the data presented, there is a possibility in uh, achieving an R0 resection. There's nothing that points me one way or another that I shouldn't be able to. And so surgical salvage with uh, adjuvant therapy, and that's a discussion and talking point, uh, would be certainly a strong consideration. Curative intent. I absolutely agree. I think these kinds of cases are challenging, but you do have to tell the patient that when we get in there, um, we're going to try as hard as we can to try to get this tumor out. Um, and with that kind of perineural invasion, I think you have to talk to them about the possibility of skip lesions, et cetera, and strongly enforce beforehand that they will need some adjuvant therapy. Uh, so the additional point here is as a team, what would be the recommendations kind of in the tumor board setting? Now this patient has had a change in status. He's had advancement of his tumor. Um, we're kind of 
kind of at the cusp of saying that, yes, we can resect this, but if it tracks back any further, then we're thinking, you know, this is going to be a hard thing to resect with negative margins. So what would our team say in the multidisciplinary setting? At what point would this patient be evaluated by medical oncology and again by radiation oncology? Maybe we'll start again with um, Dr. Henson, maybe from the uh, radiation perspective of what would you do, but then we'll bring in our medical oncology colleagues shortly to talk about whether combinatorial therapy might be considered. Either ad so let's start with adjuvant after surgery. For these cases, I feel like it's hugely important to get a hold of their prior radiation records before doing anything, before doing surgery, before deciding if you're going to be able to recommend more adjuvant radiation and to what extent you'll be able to do more radiation. For this patient, they had, I think, previously two surgeries before they had radiation. Um, so I'm assuming the prior radiation fields probably were not small. Um, but depending on whether or not they had their neck treated previously, whether or not they had their parotid treated previously. Um, so for a moment, I'll assume that they just had their pinna irradiated previously. Um, in that case, I would definitely tell this patient from the outset that they will need adjuvant radiation after their surgery, regardless of margin status, just based on the T-stage, the gross perineural invasion, and the, the lymph node involvement. Dr. McDowell, anything else to add? No, I'd, I'd agree with uh, Dr. Henson. I think it's it's really important, I guess, in these specific cases where you've got recurrence and prior radiotherapy that the radiation oncologist is also available to, um, I guess, see what the impact of the previous treatment has been, how much fibrosis there is. I guess the patient um, is in the best position, their, their physical appearance in terms of how sensitive they are to radiotherapy, because that may um, impact your ability to give um, a second round of treatment. Also, the patient may, may have had a particularly uh, bad time during the previous course of treatment, and they may have strong feelings about whether they proceed um, forward with, a, uh, with another course of treatment. So I, I guess that would be my um, additional thoughts. I, I like to see these patients um, prior to any surgery so that there's no surprises for the patient um, after um, they've had their operation either. And then Dr. McDowell, follow up with, uh, the follow-up question for you is, when you bring in your medical oncology colleagues uh, you, uh, into a, a case like this, I see Dr. Ladd was smiling over there because you're a future colleague. Um, when would you say, uh, you know, hey, I, I think maybe this patient would benefit potentially from medical oncology evaluation? What kind of things would trigger that or what kind of discussion? So I guess we're in an interesting time at the moment in terms of, um, you know, the, the field is changing um, a bit. And I guess, it depends. you know, we've been fortunate at Peter Mac to have a number of, um, you know, of studies um, evaluating the role of um, neoadjuvant immunotherapy, but also um, adjuvant therapy. Certainly this case would have been discussed at our um, MDT and at, at a minimum it would have, he would have, uh, he would be eligible seemingly based on the preoperative scans for CPOST, which is a, a study we have looking at um, uh, adjuvant simiplumab um, following surgical resection and radiotherapy. But I guess the question is with um, if the patient's rapidly progressing and progresses to unresectable um, or borderline resectable, whether it be any uh, role for uh, the medical oncologists um, seeing for um, a neoadjuvant uh, treatment. So just to clarify, you have a clinical trial using adjuvant simiplumab after a definitive surgical resection after and with, with post-operative radiation. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay. And the, the adjuvant simiplumab is, is done after the radiation is complete or concurrently and then with an outback? Um, outback. So after, um, I think they have to start within six weeks of um, mm -hmm. completion, might be eight weeks after completion of adjuvant radiotherapy. Dr. Ladwin might be able to provide more, but I, I think it's a, it's in that ballpark. Yes, Dr. Lowe, your comments. Um, so I'm going to keep it to a more adjuvant after surgery, but I, I would look, after this, we'll discuss a little bit more surgery versus palliative, non-surgical palliative approaches, but please. Sure. Um, thank you very much. It's a fantastic case to begin with. And I think it just shows the, the shifting paradigm in our multidisciplinary meeting. Uh, two years ago or three years ago, I wouldn't get referred a single patient. And everyone got asked today about where they get the referrals from. And I'll tell you where I get mine from now. It's the head and neck multidisciplinary meeting, for which we probably see about 300 of these cases a year. Probably saw four this week, believe it or not. Similar to this, actually, very similar. We have the soft tissue melanoma MDT, where now all of a sudden they're non-melanoma skin cancers getting sent through. 
We have a immunosuppressive multidisciplinary meeting, so the transplant cutaneous MDT. I'm getting a lot of referrals from there. I don't know what to do with those patients. Dermatology, private sector, a lot of patients coming through, GPs everywhere. They're coming from everywhere. And I don't know what to do. This is a fantastic case because, you know, you, you, you kind of discussed a classic patient coming through. What makes me worried here is that he's a, a, an elderly patient. I get the impression that he might be possibly frail. He's had a lot of treatment in the past, and that's your classic patient that comes through the MDTs. Um, he's got recurrence over two times now in the same spot. He's got a named nerve involvement. And there may be some anticipated morbidity, and I take you know, my, the value of my plastics and um, ENT surgeons with regards to that morbidity in the surgery in an irradiated site, and that makes me worried. And I guess Christine's point about, Christina's point about post-operative radiation and how much can be applied is important here because to enroll them on an adjuvant study with things like semiplumab, like the CPOST study, they need to have undergone a definitive course of surgery and post-operative radiotherapy. So if that's not an option, then the adjuvant study falls off the perch as well. I mean, with these patients, I'm fighting the surgeons now to say, can I have them first? Please let me give them upfront immune checkpoint inhibitor, of which we've been giving semiplumab um, therapy, but we have a lot of studies in the knee adjuvant space currently running here as well. So we're trying to recruit these patients into the study to look at the new adjuvant use of immune checkpoint in this patient. So, I really want to hear more about the new adjuvant, but I want to give Dr. Fan a chance to comment. Uh, okay. when, uh, if this when, you know, Dr. Henson referred this for a consideration, what would you consider for in the adjuvant setting after surgery? Concomitant chemoradiation with cisplatin, or I don't know if you have a similar trial with uh, simiflamab or other IO? Right. Un unfortunately, unlike uh, Dr. Lawwell, we don't have um, adjuvant um, studies. Um, in this setting, um, most of the time we would do like post-operative radiation. Now, regarding like adding like cisplatin to radiation, um, I'm not sure if there's enough data to support that. I know sometimes we notice um, maybe extrapolating from the head and neck mucosal squamous cell carcinoma and adding cisplatin maybe for high-risk features. But uh, usually right now we are just proceeding with um, post-operative radiation. So we would love to have some of those adjuvant trials here in Oklahoma. Thanks. I'm going to take advantage of the moment to ask Dr. Ladwa directly. You know, there was that trans-Tasman study for randomized radiation versus chemoradiation from, from the co cooperative group, um, you know, in Australia and New Zealand. Has basically adjuvant chemoradiation with cisplatin largely fallen out of favor in favor of immunotherapy? Is that a fair statement? Yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, you know, we were, we were um, running that study here. Um, and so we, we followed the paradigm that I think post-operative chemo radiation was probably not beneficial to the patients in, in most subgroups. Um, and this one included post-operative radiotherapy is what we've been given, but with the introduction of immune checkpoints, I think that's now going to overtake any sort of debate in that setting. Thank you. Dr. McDowell, a comment. I think just in regard to the post study, the adjuvant um, study that was conducted through Trog, I think it's just important to highlight that that study did use carboplatin rather than cisplatin. Um, so I, I think the question about cisplatin is probably wasn't uh, wasn't answered, um, and whether carboplatin was a, um, enough of a radio sensitizer in that um, in that group, I guess um, it certainly wasn't in that study. No, I stand corrected. That's an excellent point. You're, yes. Um, Rusha, you want to proceed? I do. So, um, you know, we've kind of hit some of the, the non-operative management as well. And I um, will tell you guys what I did. So we went ahead with surgery, um, auriculectomy, lateral temporal bone resection, called in my otology colleagues, prodidectomy, neck dissection. Um, the facial nerve margin was negative um, at the mastoid segment. He got a facial nerve graft and reconstruction. And we've kind of hit on our adjuvant treatment recommendations. I wanted to, um, you know, I missed the slide. There we go. I also know that we've been talking a lot about new adjuvant therapy, and I wanted to just include this uh, slide, which is a little bit older data, but really, um, I think for surgeons, it's great data. So this comes out of a study from MD Anderson. It was a small study, 20 patients who got neoadjuvant uh, semiplumab. They got two doses, surgery 21 days after their last dose. And of the 20, there were 14 patients that had a complete pathologic response. Um, and what's more interesting, I think, is about, so 60%, a small number, but 60% were spared um, adjuvant treatment and they were recurrence-free at almost two years. 
I think for surgeons, this is a great piece of data because we don't enjoy operating on patients that have really difficult disease either. We are hoping that we can clear the disease. We are hoping we can get the patients out of the operating room, recover, you know, elderly patients like this. This is who gets these really bad squamous cell carcinomas. Um, and so I think in this whole world of immunotherapy and neoadjuvant therapy, we are glad that we have our colleagues that we can now send these patients to. Uh, and so I think we just had a couple additional discussion points uh, to finish out the rest of, I think we have like nine more minutes in this case. Yeah, so I guess, um, let's make a quick comment on central lymph node biopsy, at least in, in my practice, um, we try to use it selectively in high risk patients. Uh, high risk, we can have a discussion with it, exactly that means, but I think the data is fairly good for its, um, well, it's fairly good in terms of we can do it. We're not really sure, and we, I think it's representative, but we're not really sure how much of an impact it has on survival. We don't have sort of MSLT level data for this kind of uh, information. Uh, Rusha, would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. So I offer my patients either we can do a sentinel node biopsy and I, I tell them it can give us some information or we can follow their neck uh, with ultrasounds. Uh, at six month intervals for two years, because most patients, if they're going to recur, look regionally, it's going to be within the first two years. So I give them those options um, and just kind of monitor them. But you know, if it's a uh, if it's an advanced tumor for me, that means you know by size greater than two centimeters, it's already in the head and neck because they're seeing me. Um, and if it's already you know a T three, then I'll at least offer it and see what they say. Otherwise, know that they'll need to come back in for monitoring. And um, Dr. Henson has to step away. She mentioned that she has a, a okay a protocol. And never, it seems like she, none of us ever stop working. Uh, Dr. McDowell, I just want to take the moment for immunocompromised patients. Do you have a lower threshold to deliver radiation in this context um, when there's sort of a softer indication in terms of the high risk feature? I, I guess the gray zone is a bit less gray in, um, in those patients. Um, certainly, this the case that's presented here is not this is certainly not a gray zone from you know the treatment paradigms we have um, in Australia but certainly um, I guess it's a having a discussion with the with the patients we know these patients tend to do much worse than um, you know than matched cohorts of patients without immunosuppression so um, you know I would we would tend to have a lower bar and we may also tend to have um, a lower bar for I guess more extensive surgery um, in terms of neck dissections um, uh, or extent of neck dissections um, up front for those patients uh, who are immunocompromised. Thank you. And then Dr. Fenn, can you comment on the usage of immunotherapy in um, patients with solid organ transplant who are immunosuppressed? It's a very um, controversial yeah. topic and obviously some details there, but maybe give us some broad stroke. Sure, I mean, most in, in a lot of these immune checkpoint inhibitor trials, they excluded like solid organ transplant patients. Um, so at the moment, I am applying that to my practice. If they had um, a transplanted liver, I tend I wouldn't um, offer them immune checkpoint inhibitors. Maybe um, if they need systemic treatment, I've been using like uh, carboplatin, paclitaxel. Um, I have used Tatuximab uh, in the past um, for, for these patients when they need systemic treatment and avoid um, immunotherapy. Dr. Ludwig, any comments about, um, and, and then, uh, you know, immunocompromised comes in a lot of flavors, right? There's solid organ transplant at one end, but you sort of individual with CLL. I'm curious about how you apply immunotherapy in this context. Yeah, uh, I, I just uh, one quick comment about Rusha's neoadjuvant study. I just want to flag to the group that, you know, that, that's been updated in the last um, few months. So there's a 79 patient study now being presented showing fantastic data going forward. So have a look at that paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. In the immune suppressed setting, um, if they control CLL, I feel like they'd respond just as well as the immunocompetence from my, my experience. Although it's really disappointing they're all excluded from the clinical trials. In regards to the transplant patient population, we do, I usually find that they have exhausted a lot of treatment before they refer to me and appropriately so. They're usually heavily pre-radiated, lots of surgery, obviously multiple comorbidities. If they got renal transplant, then we discuss the pros and cons about going back to dialysis, for example, and offering the immune checkpoint inhibitor. We don't freely have access to cetuximab, although, you know, I find that the benefit there is, is modest at best. 
Um, and chemotherapy generally has the same sort of response, I find. So they're always in a difficult situation. But if you can pick that one patient who does well on the immune checkpoint and doesn't lose their graft, um, it's just a fantastic outcome because the prognosis is overall very poor for that group of patients. Thank you. We have about five more minutes. I just wanted to wrap it up with the discussion. So, at, you know, for this at this point, if we roll back the clock, the patient is being offered or considered for surgical resection with a, um, at, you know, with adjuvant radiation plus or minus either IL either on trial versus well, period. Uh, versus, what about a palliative approach? Can you just maybe comment with starting with either uh, Dr. Henson, Dr. Fan, or Dr. Patel? Like, how does your team sort of? negotiate out these conversations um, between a curative intent with a high morbidity and uncertainty in the resection versus really great data showing that, you know, the, at least the first initial steps with semiflumab are likely to be uh, a good response to therapy um, for at least a period of time. Um, I still, Henson, yes, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I feel like we're only just now starting to have those like definitive-ish semiflumab conversations. Um, in our clinic, I, a lot of times on, on my end, it ends up being that conversation of like radical radiation versus palliative radiation and just kind of getting a sense of what the patient is willing to undergo for what amount of, of potential benefit. Um, so the, the conversation part is, is very important. What were you going to say, Rusha? Yeah, I think what I what I love about our group is it's not just um, like an eyeball gestalt. When we see a patient who has advanced stage, you know, kind of low chance of cure, uh, I think that we do a really good job about going back to the data. We have a lot of data on this kind of thing. We have data about you know salvage cases and longevity, local regional recurrence rates. We have data on primary radiation, even primary immunotherapy at this point. So I think if you look at the numbers, you can decide what's going to be the best for your patient. And things like comorbidities and that factor into it as well. So I think what, what we usually do as a team, what I love about it is we can come up with kind of a, a database plan for a patient to say, hey, you know what, I think this is the least risky option for you with the best chance of cure, all things considered. Dr. McDowell, Dr. Laura, how does the MDT work in Australia when you have to negotiate the uh, high morbidity curative resection with adjuvant versus, you know, very reasonable, well-tolerated um, IO as first steps in the palliative space. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really great open discussion. And in the head and neck multidisciplinary meeting, we still have the patient that comes in ahead of time before we have that sit down discussion. And at that point, the surgeons, the rad onks and the med onks have all sat down and spoke to the patient, including all the allied teams, et cetera. Um, so the patient has a really good understanding of sort of which direction we're all thinking. And, and, and it's nice to have that debate up front and then come back and consolidate that. Um, it's, it's really interesting. I think from a patient perspective, you know, by the time they've got to a discussion of immune checkpoint, they've already probably had good surgery or offered surgery or had surgery in the past, had radiation in the past. And a lot of these patients, from my experience, personal experience, they're actually looking for a, a different type of option. The immune therapy approach is very appealing. I don't know what other people find in the group. You know, uh, offering them a different type of approach um, that they haven't had before, I think it's very acceptable to a lot of these patients, um, from my experience. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, often, I mean, we're seeing a lot, more, because the space is evolving so quickly, we're actually seeing a lot more patients come in um, after they've decided that they're not for you know radical surgical approach they're actually counseled by the surgeons about proceeding forward with um a trial you know a, a trial not on a trial but um of immuno you know, of immunotherapy and you know we've been fortunate enough to be able to have um compassionate access um for our patients um so we've had a number of patients go on to that i think it you know the the one of the things i would um, I think radiotherapy is very effective for these patients and it really comes down to, I guess, what you're um, irradiating um, and whether, you know, a, someone's got a, a, an unresectable node in their, you know, in their supraclavicular fossil, which you could deal with four weeks of radiotherapy um, and likely to get re a reasonable chance of local control versus putting them onto um, immunotherapy. And I'm not really sure how long that immunotherapy would go for, but some patients may choose to do that. Um, over, you know, versus having to, you know, co comprehensively irradiate, you know, facial nerve into base of skull plus the entire neck. So I think those are things that, uh, you know, that we also um, consider when we're having those discussions with patients. 
Well, thank you very much for this first case for the panel. It is exactly 7.30. I would take a moment just to touch on some of these Q&As that are um, in the chat, and then we'll move on to our next case. But thank you very much. Um, there was a comment about, uh, I agree that, you know, carboplatin is probably less, used less than cisplatin, um, at least on this side of town uh, or the hemisphere. Um, but I don't, you know, the design is what it is. And I think sometimes they want to maybe use carboplatin probably to maximize patient access for those who are more elderly. Um, there's uh, someone has post nicely posted the um, new growth paper looking at uh, the pathological CR or complete, excuse me, pathological complete response. Uh, Neil Gross is a um, head and neck surgeon at MD Anderson with his team down there. Um, they showed pathological complete response for neoadjuvant simiplumab and then definitive resection afterward, which is some new and interesting and meaningful data for us to uh, further chew on um, another time, unfortunately, but uh, trying to understand, you know, that the pathological C uh, complete response is, um, I think it was like 40% or 50% of all the patients they operated on. I'm about to click on the look at it. But I would also comment that we don't know what to do next, right? Now, do you watch them? Do you give them radiation? Do you, you know, and then you know, we don't know how to pick these individuals out of the gate. So it's a very exciting time with very uh, robust data that just seems to beg more questions. Um, and then maybe just a final uh, question coming for Dr. Fan or um, uh, Dr. Ladwa. There's a question of whether or not medical oncologists are offering adjuvant IO, I think outside of a trial setting um, after surgery. Um, oh, Dr. Ladway, yeah, make, make a comment and then I'll bring up my slides in the meantime. Sorry, I just, uh, it was a perfect time to, uh, to go into the study we're running at the Princess Alexandra Hospital called Descome. And I, I you know, I, ha I have to say it because it's a perfect time. You know, it's a really good question after neoadjuvant therapy, if patients have had a, a pathological complete response, do they need the full gamut of the full surgery, the full post-operative radiation, and ca can it be de-escalated based on their pathological response? So we're running that study right now at the Princess Alexandra Hospital, and hopefully it will give you some information in the next year or so with regards to that. In terms of the adjuvant um, IO, I, I, outside of a trial, I'm not offering adjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, uh, you know, I have access to that, so that's okay. Those patients that are high risk that don't fit in the classic, um, you know, enrollment for an adjuvant immune checkpoint therapy trial, I'm actually keeping a close eye on them and then we'll offer them immune checkpoint if we need it in the future. Sorry, I'm trying to manipulate. Same, Dr. Go ahead and then I'll bring up my slide. Right, in, right, in terms of like adjuvant immune checkpoint handler, I'm not offering it unless in context of a clinical trial. All right, thank you. Um, can you see my slides now? Oh, uh, Dr. McDowell, you have a final word or you're good? It was just to, uh, just to add on to the, um, you know, the role of radiotherapy after these patients have had um, simiplumab and have had a good response. I think at ASCO this year, they did an update of that pilot study um, from MD Anderson. And there are 11 patients who had a complete response out of um, they're 20. After three years, I think it was 37 months, or, um, none of those patients had actually recurred. So it's, uh, you know, I guess that sort of lay, lays the foundations for, um, you know, for what uh, Dr. Ladwell was talking about. And I guess an exciting time for patients to potentially um, not have to endure um, adjuvant radiotherapy um, if they have had a good um, or a complete response. Thank you. Well, this has been an excellent discussion for the first case. Thank you so much. We're going to slightly switch roles. I'm going to become the presenter and Dr. Patel will be more the moderator. Again, thanking my co-panelists and everyone here for making the time, especially our um, friends from down under who are working at, at a very uh, inconvenient time. So thank you. Uh, um, again, these um, disclosure, but I really want to thank the Hoffman LaRoche for supporting today's webinar and making this webinar possible. Thank you so much and supporting the American Head Neck Society. So this is a case for oropharyngeal recurrence. It's a 65 year old male who presented with a left side of neck mass and a left tonsillar fossa mass. In the biopsy showed squamous cell carcinoma with basaloid features that was consistent with a P16 positive squamous cell carcinoma with 100% staging. And he was staged as a stage one uh, T2N1 M0. This is uh, some initial imaging to get us sort of started. Um, you can see here on the left-hand image, uh, the uh, cancer is in the oropharynx extending into the um, glossal tonsillar sulcus on the left. Um, there's a neck lymph node you can see on the right-hand side. And of note, the cancer also extended onto the, um, onto the palate and onto the uvula, which images are not shown. And this is why the patient elected to proceed with a non-surgical approach initially for treatment. 
Here's a PET scan showing, uh, as very common, these cystic lymph nodes uh, have sort of a mixed uh, PET avidity because of their cystic nature, but you can see the primary site very nicely. So this is the initial presentation. He underwent uh, concomitant chemo radiation therapy with weekly cisplatin at 40 milligrams per meter squared, and he tolerated therapy well. And then a year passes by where he's done pretty okay. But then he notices a new onset fullness of the left oral pharynx near the site of his prior disease. And the patient also developed new onset trismus, which is certainly a ominous sign. And a CT scan and PET scan are performed. And so on the left-hand side is a six-month CT scan, which looked reasonably normal. Um, in a post-treatment space, but then you can see a year later in the onset of his trismus that there has been um, a progressive lesion of the left glossotonchal focus concerning for recurrence. And lo and behold, um, the, here's the PET scan showing uh, FDG avidity in this area consistent with the recurrence. And you can see that there's little to no disease in the neck from the, or actually no disease in the neck reported with the resolution of the regional disease. And now this patient's biopsy shows recurrent squamous cell carcinoma. This is from the primary site. And to help our medical oncology colleagues, the CPS score is 70. The patient has significant trismus with limited transoral access. So um, I'll defer to Dr. Patel about uh, next steps and next questions. Sure, so I think the, the next obvious question is, um, what do we do next as a treatment team? And specifically, I guess I'll ask you, uh, would this patient get surgery at your institution? And then what would your approach be there? I think the patient would be offered the consideration of surgery in the context of a multidisciplinary team, um, starting with the fact that the patient has a uh, local recurrence, but no other evidence of disease elsewhere. So by some measure, the patient has an avenue towards surgical salvage that is uh, a pathway to cure. That, that pathway is guarded, to be sure. That pathway is narrow, to be sure. But a complete surgical resection of the primary cancer is um, a, a consideration for a pathway to cure. Um, but with obviously significant morbidity, uh, it would involve resection of the um, left posterior base of tongue, left pharynx, a mandibulotomy or mandibulectomy may be necessary for access uh, and removal because there's no transoral option given the trismus, and at least a hemi uh, removal of half the soft palate, so um, and a free flat reconstruction. So the there's a possibility for chronic aspiration and chronic tracheostomy, and um, the likelihood of this patient swallowing um, post treatment, uh, whatever the after surgery and whatever risk adapted adjuvant is unlikely. And that's how I couched it to the patient that we could offer surgical, a pathway to, sur uh, excuse me, a surgical pathway to cure, but it may come at the risk of a permanent tracheostomy and, um, you know, in, uh, indefinite difficulty with uh, uh, um, PO intake and also articulation of speech. Right. So knowing all of those things, um, I'll ask Dr. Fan and uh, next Dr. Ladwa, um, what, you know, if we're considering kind of non-surgical options in this patient who's just recently done with chemo radiation, what kinds of things are you looking for from the tumor? And Dr. Liu has helpfully put some guiding questions here. Uh, you're looking at CPS testing, other kinds of molecular testing. Where do we go with this? Right. No, this is very helpful in terms of getting a, C, a combined positive score. Because if it's, you know, usually if it's like 20 or more, we could offer monotherapy, like pembrolizumab, immunotherapy. Unless he's like very symptomatic, um, you can offer him uh, chemotherapy, usually like carboplatin, uh, 5-FU with pembrolizumab. Um, in, in this situation, if we cannot do additional radiation or surgery. Um, next generation sequencing, um, we, we have a clinical trial here that looks for like HRAS mutation um, for HRAS inhibitors. Um, so um, our patients here at OU will uh, get next generation sequencing uh, for actionable mutations. And um, since we also have a phase one department, it's helpful for them too in case they have targeted, uh, targeted experimental or clinical trials for these patients. Sure. Dr. Ladwa, um, are you guys doing the same thing, next generation sequencing, it sounds like? Yeah, I agree with Dr. Fan. Um, uh, we do whole exome sequencing um, and we look at, you know, multiple signals, including HRAS, uh, NOTCH, PI3 kinase, and a few others. Um, you know, it's P16 positive, so HRAS is probably, you know, unlikely to be positive, but if you get that one patient that's positive and get access to the drugs, which is the harder part, I find, to the then, um, you know, that gives us a potential treatment option uh, 
uh, first line, I think I'll do CPS with this chap and then base his treatment um, with uh, immuno plus or minus chemotherapy. And I'll ask uh, kind of the group, and I'll start probably with Dr. Henson. So this patient, is this somebody who we would have monitored with circulating tumor HPV DNA during that year? I'm not sure. I'm assuming this patient probably had a pet. Um, we didn't see, see a pet scan, the but um, uh, sorry, a post. Oh, that was the post-treatment pet. Uh, that's the, um, three, I mean, a three month. Was there a three month? Uh, I'm not sorry. The patient didn't have a three month pet. Okay. Okay. So we, we would have gotten a three month post post treatment pet, obviously, but we, you know, we've, we've started to monitor these patients with DTDNA, especially if there are equivocal findings on their three month post treatment pet. Sure. Yeah. And Dr. McDowell, um, one, are you guys using circulated tumor DNA to monitor these patients? And two, how would you kind of approach the, the idea of re-radiation in this patient as an option? Yeah, so they're, they're good questions. I think that, you know, everything's evolving in terms of, um, you know, the application of um, CT DNA for, uh, for these patients. We haven't um, taken that up um, at this point in time. I'm not sure if Dr. Bladwick can comment, but I don't think that's been as widely accessible in Australia um, as it has been um, in the US um, in recent times, but it's certainly something that um, I guess I would be very interested um, in using in the future, particularly um, because although this is a, you know, this is a great case, it's probably you know the the le the less common of where people are going to pattern of failure, um, and I guess monitoring these patients for distant metastases is probably uh, where the role of that will have its um, you know will have, will find its strength. I guess in terms of um, evaluating um, these patients for you know, for re-irradiation, I think it's a really challenging um, assessment. I, you know, most of these times um, the patients have a lot to gain, but they also have um, the most to lose in terms of the impact on their long-term quality of life and, um, and potential toxicity. It's about, you know, the things that I guess weigh into my decision, I guess, is one, assessing the patient in terms of the impacts of previous radiotherapy, even though some patients have had 70 grade through their RF pharynx, sometimes when you're evaluating these patients with long-term follow-up, they don't actually look like they've had <laughs> or, you know, very little radiotherapy and other people will look like, you know, there's really very little room um, to give them um, any further treatment. I think that's really important um, as a first, um, as a first step. Um, and then I guess you're weighing up, you know, the, um, the ARS has re-irradiation guidelines and they, um, they're, a very, they're a very good read and there are multi-institutional uh, recursive partition analysis um, studies that have been done, which look at, you know, those patients who are likely to have the most favourable outcomes or the class ones were those patients who had had a, a two years since their treatment with no end organ uh, dysfunction and trismus might be included. Um, in that and who was surgically and who had the capability of being surgical resectable. Those patients had a four year survival of about uh, around 40%, I think. So those are, the, those are the factors that I'd be weighing up um, as well as the patient preference and appetite for, um, I guess, embarking on a fairly toxic treatment. Yeah, definitely a lot to consider there. Um, so Dr. Liu, what did you guys end up doing? Next steps. Oh, I am. Um... I was going to, we sort of touched about these earlier, but I, uh, Rishi, uh, this is my next slide for the discussion. I don't know if you want to keep going here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, this is a great question. You know, usually these patients, at least in our paradigm, are seen by the surgeon, and then we call in our colleagues. Um, but, you know, how are, uh, how are these patients seen, you know, Dr. Ladwa, for example, in your practice? Do they come back, see the surgeon, and they're referred to you, and then you go on to your multidisciplinary conversation? Yeah, correct. Um, they're usually followed up post um, chemo radiation by the radiation oncologist and the ENT um, in our institute. And then uh, they get rediscussed at the head and neck multidisciplinary meeting when we review their scans, for example, or we're worried about them. And they usually then get referred on back to probably the treating medical oncologist, um, for example. Um, I, I think, you know, with the, with the introduction of sort of monitoring. Um, uh, assessments like salivary uh, HPV and things like that, where I find that, you know, the medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists, uh, depending on who's leading those studies, are now seeing these patients for more often, actually. So 
that's actually made things a little bit more interesting, I guess, in the surveillance post chemo radiation for HPV positive disease anyway. So, you know, I know we touched about some of the options that we would offer as different disease teams for this patient, but a question that I, I always kind of think about is, you know, let's say this patient is not really keen on surgical salvage. Um, he's not really a re-radiation candidate and we're looking at um, medical options alone. How would we counsel this patient about their response rates? What, what do you guys tell them? I guess we can start with Dr. Fan and then go to Dr. Ladla. Right, and you know, just, I would usually would quote data from uh, Keynote 048. Um, I believe the overall population you know, uh, with chemoimmunotherapy, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about what, 30, 40% response rate overall, um, higher CPF score, anywhere what, about mid 30s, 40%. Um, now, I know like if they had, in the past, like when we did second line immunotherapy, the response rate was much lower. Um, but for upfront, you know, chemo immunotherapy, that's kind of um, what I would quote um, in overall survival, um, depending again, uh, which, you know, the CPS, how high it was, could be um, like 11, uh, 11 months overall survival. Um, the total population with uh, immunotherapy, chemo, chemo immunotherapy, and then with the um, high CPS score, um, you know, I believe it's like around 14 months of survival uh, from the keynote, keynote uh, 048 data. But of course, we also talk about goals of care at that point, um, about adverse effects and, and how the patient would want to proceed uh, per their bills of care discussion. Sure. Uh, Dr. Ladwa, um, similar kind of thing in terms of response rates, similar discussion? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly, exactly the same. Um, uh, you know, 40% response rate, and uh, uh, with the chemo rads, about 39%. And and and, and you know, the, the addition of chemotherapy is based on multiple factors. You know, PDL1 CPS is important. But, you know, patient symptoms, local obstructive symptoms, how much treatment they've had before, what their goals of treatment all come into it. And frailty, of course, comes into it as well. Usually when we have this discussion with a patient, if they're not keen on surgery initially, they might want to go back to surgery, I find. So it's really interesting to have that discussion in the multidisciplinary meeting because I don't think you can make a final recommendation as we've done in previous cases where, you know, the surgeons see them, then they get to the med onks. And then they end up sometimes going back to the surgeons again after having that discussion. And that 15 month mark that we, you know, quote to them is, is fantastic compared to previous studies, but the patient might say, you know, it's a really poor prognosis overall still in this setting. I did have a question for our radiation oncology colleagues that if the patient was surgically salvaged successfully with an R0 resection, um, gastrostomy tube dependent, what is your team's enthusiasm for giving adjuvant rear radiation after salvage therapy? I guess I'll ask Dr. Henson first. I think for an R0 resection, no. Um, we would we would usually reserve that for margin concerns. Um, other, I feel like occasional situations where we will offer it at the behest of our surgeons is if there's like really extensive LVSI, like all the way up to a clear margin. Um, or something like that. But I agree. I, I don't think I would, you know, for an R naught resection in the absence of any other adverse factors, um, I don't think we I would be recommending um, adjuvant therapy, but, but close, um, close clinical surveillance moving forward. Very good. Should I move on, Rusha? Yeah, I think we should move on. Yeah, I'll tell you what we did. So the patient, um, as as commented was a, a poor candidate. Well, the patient was not interested in a surgical salvage given the high morbidity associated with surgical resection. So that we had a clinical trial open at the time uh, for pembrolizumab and re radiation as the heat met criteria of having a recurrence greater than six months from his initial treatment, which is a um, hyperfraction radiation uh, protocol with pembrolizumab con concomitant with um, Q3 week pembrolizumab um, as outback. Um, unfortunately, four months later, the patient um, had a documented uh, recurrence of months after completion of treatment. So this is after 
completion with the on the Pember re irradiation trial. Um, and then uh, ultimately the patient then went on carbotaxel cefuximab for five cycles, uh, but expired um, about about 12 months after the initiation of that when uh, therapy when uh, his disease progressed. So uh, that's uh, that's my presentation. Um, I just wanted to put this one slide up. Um, this is Carol Factory's paper in JCO showing that in general, P16 negative oral pharyngeal cancers when undergoing salvage surgery uh, do better than uh, P16, sorry, P16 positive cancers undergoing salvage surgery do better than P16 negative patients undergoing salvage surgery um, and that there can be some uh, durable control uh, in, the, in this patient population, but certainly a, a lot of challenges. Um, I guess we can roll back a little bit. So on, on, once you, once, uh, if you've been, if given IO and then re irradiation, would anybody here want to, what would you typically do next? Or should I think about doing surgery at this point? But usually patients are pretty sick at this point. But yeah, that's a, I think that's a great question because surgery is still technically on the table if, you know, you think you can get local regional control. Um, but, and then we kind of know what was given, but any other thoughts from members of our team about what your next steps would be in the non-surgical realm or? Uh, I guess if we're having a discussion of whether surgery should be offered, I mean, the good thing about this is knowing after four months of treatment, this patient has a popped up multiple systemic metastases, it's not progressed, and the biology is probably more conducive for having more of a targeted or definitive approach to the local primary. So I guess that gives me a bit more confidence um, that that should be at least rediscussed with the patient. Thank you. No, I, I, thank you. Other comments? I think Dr. Fan's having um, some audio issues at this time. All right, let me um, finish. I think that's all the slides I had. Oh, I'm putting in a plug for the international meeting in Montreal for um, July. Uh, 2023. But um, final comment, Dr. Patel, any final comments or questions? Or from the no, panel? I think uh, one thing that I had kind of listed is if or to ask our medical oncology team, and I'm sorry, I'm really focusing on you guys heavily here, because I think we have an opportunity to use your expertise. Is, is there any role for uh, combination uh, immunotherapy in patients like this? Or is that something that's being done? Um, kind of multiple regimens that are given. I know that there's been some studies that have looked at this, but just curious if any of your institutions have tried something like that. Um, I might answer that if Dr. Fan's still um, unavailable, but um, uh, for combination immune therapy in the metastatic recurrence setting, the Checkmate 651 study was um, published looking at nivolumab and ipilimumab, and it wasn't really, didn't meet its primary endpoint over chemotherapy within the um, extreme regime. So um, at this point in time, no, no real role for a double IO without the chemotherapy. And I think the chemotherapy is here to stay. I think this type of head and neck cancer, you know, usually you need some chemotherapy to induce local control. And that's where I felt like that trial might have possibly failed. And in the concurrent chemo radiation setting, there's no role for IO right now. There's been multiple negative studies looking at avalumab and pembrolizumab with concurrent chemo radiation. So again, an area that we need to sort of further focus into. Now, I guess now's a great time to ask, should we be grouping this whole group of tumors as mucosal head and neck squamous cell cancers, or should we be now thinking about subtypes and looking more at molecular classifications and immune microenvironments? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's on, on everybody's mind is how we actually pick these patients for the best response. And I think our classic kind of, you know, oral cavity or pharynx, larynx just doesn't apply. I don't think it's specific enough. You know, if we want to get a little bit challenging with this case, um, I think a situation that all of us have seen is a patient that has, you know, either primary disease or recurrent disease, they may have a single isolated metastatic site, um, you know, somewhere in the lung, a small lung nodule. You know, how do we approach those patients? I know the paradigm has changed over the last 15 years or so about how you approach a patient who's presenting with, you know, local disease and isolated um, site of metastatic disease. So I guess my question is, you know, is that a patient that you would consider a primary surgery or a salvage surgery knowing that um, the disease is kind of the cat's out of the bag? Or are there other treatment options that we can offer this patient? For example, SBRT or something like that. I guess you're assuming the same kind of um, 
kinetics. This is a one year post treatment with a single metastasis. Yep. I, I guess it's, I don't know what the right answer to do. I have to say that we've probably done both um, depending on um, depending on patient preference availability of, um, um, of, of a clinical trial um, that incorporates um, IO rather than, I guess, chemotherapy um, alone. Uh, but I have had at least one patient who's preferred not to have any more radiation treatment, even, um, you know, even when that, that has been an isolated uh, lung metastasis based on their previous experience. So um, I, I think... I think it's hard to know. I would be, it's very multi, multi, multidisciplinary discussion um, and weighing in patient treatment. I wouldn't, for that particular case, I think the, I think you could go ahead with either local treatment um, and, um, and treat the metastasis, you know, similarly uh, with either um, stereotactic, you could wedge it out, but you could also simply put these patients on, onto an IO trial. I think all three, uh, I, I think there's a number of reasonable options um, and then it really depend on, um, I guess, the um, trade-offs in terms of toxicity for the patient. You know, I think the with mucosal disease, it remains a bigger challenge in some ways. The IO response we know is significantly lower than the cutaneous, like our last case, but also the morbidity aspect is a lot higher. And I'm not saying that a lateral temporal bone resection and free flap is a non-morbid procedure, but compared to a procedure that's going to involve uh, resecting the um, you know, oral pharynx and running the patient a swallow cripple indefinitely with or without a tracheostomy, I think the stakes are a little bit higher. Um, but I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion, I'd like to think, I just want to hear some comments and thoughts from the panel that it's easy to reach for immunotherapy now in the rec uh, recurrent space because the um, morbidity profile is much significantly more favorable than surgical salvage. Um, and then somehow surgery doesn't exactly fall off the table. Of the, like, in, like in the case I just presented, you give immunotherapy um, with Pembro, they still recurred, but the, you know, it, they still haven't met it out. All of a sudden you wonder if you can play your surgical card at a later time, if the disease declares itself. Is that how a lot of your disease teams have been functioning? You kind of play the immunotherapy card first because it's a low cost, potentially high reward outcome. Then if, as long as the patient has admitted out, maybe we reintroduce either surgery or re radiation again. I know we're in a lot of uncharted territory post IO. Uh, just a few comments about that. Look, um, I, I usually get hounded for how many, how much my drugs cost actually. So I think I wouldn't say it's a low cost. So each, each immune checkpoint that we give is about 7,000 Australian dollars. So, um, you know, you can get a, get an idea of how much that is. It obviously diff differs in different areas. Um, whilst surgery or radiation approach would be, I, I guess, more cost effective. Um, you know, I guess the, the discussion has to be had that the immune checkpoints given in the palliative setting. So we're not here to salvage, we're not here to resect a cure, especially in the mucosal head and neck setting. And I guess we need to give it for a good reason. I think if there's, uh, you know, um, indeterminate lesions that we're still trying to find if they're going to be metastatic disease or not, or if we're trying to test the biology, then a period of upfront therapy would be suitable and I've been favoring chemo IO in that setting rather than any induction type chemotherapy um, and then offer the salvage um, is, is appropriate but if if it's upfront salvageable um, I, I, I usually push towards that. Very good. Well you know we have uh, exactly one minute I think left. Um, I wanted to thank all our panelists and I wanted to just kind of leave us with a takeaway. I think what we opened with is totally true. You know, we're not in the paradigm anymore where head and neck surgeons are treating head and neck cancer kind of in a box and calling on their colleagues as needed. I think we really are in a paradigm where we were making these decisions together. And thank goodness that we are, because as I said, we don't want to be operating on patients that are going to have a high morbidity from our surgeries. We want to be able to offer them other therapies that can give them kind of the perfect balance between the lesser morbidity and the higher rate of cure. So uh, I think we have a couple of questions that maybe are remaining. Nope, we don't. So everybody has gotten their questions answered. Um, thank you all so much for doing all of that. That's wonderful. Thank you for having us. Yeah, I'd like to thank all the panel. Thank you so much. Roche and the American Society. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.